Welcome to the Friends with Money podcast, brought to you by Money Magazine, creating financial freedom for Australians since 1999. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Friends with Money podcast. My name is Tom Watson, a senior journalist here at Money Magazine, and it's great to be with you once again. For the second time this year, we are on the cusp of a federal budget, though this time around, there's an entirely new government at the helm. In addition to a new government, a lot has changed since March, though, with rising inflation having caused all manner of headaches at home and abroad. So with that in mind, we thought we'd take this opportunity to gaze into our special budget crystal ball once again to see what Treasurer Jim Chalmers might have in store for us on budget night. And I'm pleased to say that uh, peering into that crystal ball with me is Chief Economist and Head of Investment Strategy at AMP, Dr. Shane Oliver. It's a, uh, a pleasure to have you back on the show, Shane. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. So to set the scene, can you give us a bit of an overview of the economic landscape right now in terms of inflation, interest rates, and any other factors that may influence what the government uh, can and can't do this budget night? Well, basically, the economy is facing fairly difficult circumstances. We saw a nice recovery coming out from the lockdowns of 2020 and 2021. But of course, uh, as we've heard a lot uh, lately, we've got a problem with inflation. Inflation uh, numbers have pushed up to 7%, possibly heading a little bit higher. And uh, that's a bigger problem globally. So central banks have raised interest rates dramatically. The inflation problem was initially triggered by supply disruptions associated with the pandemic and distortions to, de to demand. Uh, but it's since broadened out to reflect, obviously, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, which put upwards pressure on commodity prices, particularly energy prices. And that uh, effect is still working its way through uh, uh, and, uh, and is a much bigger problem in Europe, of course. And then, of course, um, we've seen very strong demand and it's the strong demand that central banks like the Reserve Bank have been trying to slow down. For example, retail sales are still around 15, 16% above their pre-COVID trend. Uh, so, and we've got very, very low unemployment and that's a sign that the capacity of the economy to produce is somewhat stretched and that's contributed to inflation. So central banks are trying to slow things down. Uh, and then of course, uh, people are seeing cost of living pressures. So this combination of a higher cost of living with uh, higher interest rates um, is likely to result in slower growth in the year ahead. Uh, obviously, uh, with that pickup in inflation, the interest rate hikes have been the most significant since uh, the uh, early 1990s, 1994, in fact, we've had uh, the official cash rate go up by 250 basis points or 2.5%. percent have not seen anything like that since 1994. Um, and all of these things are causing a lot of consternation, concerns about the, the growth outlook going forward and hardship for those households who are already struggling, uh, but particularly those with mortgages. So that's the backdrop that the government is producing this budget into. And we've seen in the UK, of course, that if uh, the government gets too stimulatory, like they did over the year, then it uh, can lead to even higher bond yields and interest rates and more pressure on the central bank. So it's a, very, a bit of a balancing act, if you like, for the, the government coming into this budget. So moving on to the budget itself, is there anything that the government has already hinted at that is likely to feature? There, there's a bunch of things the government has hinted at and it may feature in this budget. Um, yeah, for some reason, there's not as many rumours flying around as uh, or kite flying as there was in response to previous budgets. I, th I think part of it is because the government has said that um, the, the budgetary process, the policy changes will... Um, occur over the course of several budgets because this is already our second budget this year. There's another one to come in May next year. Um, so it, it seems as if the government is going to mainly focus on implementing its policies, particularly i.e. those policies it went to the election with. Um, so I suspect we're going to see quite a lot on that. Uh, key policies of relevance here were uh, more on childcare, in fact, increasing the childcare subsidy to 90% for the first child in care, uh, creating more places in universities and free TAFE places. That was a key promise of the government. Um, 
more support for manufacturing. They're talking about a $15 billion national reconstruction fund. I think we'll probably hear a little bit about that. I don't quite know whether they're going to actually go as far as $15 billion. We're probably going to see um, uh, implementation of some of their housing policies. They talked about a $10 billion Housing Australia Fund with to build 30,000 social homes over five years. There's also a Help to Buy scheme where the government takes 40% equity in up to 10,000 first-time buyer purchases. So those sort of policies will probably start to get implemented in this budget. I, th- I think we're probably going to see quite a lot of focus on cutting administrative costs and what the government often refer- refers to as rorts. Uh, that arose under the previous government. Um, but I don't think we're going to see a slash and burn budget. Uh, you know, we may see more pressure on spending in subsequent budgets, um, but I don't think we'll see slash and burn through this budget, but we will see some savings made. The other area where they uh, they referred to was uh, tax revenue on, on multinationals, so we'll probably see some action on that. I guess a um, big uncertainty is whether we'll see a cost of living support, um, and that's going to be a big one because people are obviously still seeing that as a huge issue, just as they were back in March. It's, if anything, it's got worse since then. Uh, the messages we're getting from Canberra have been somewhat mixed on that front. On the one hand, they're saying that they're not going to do too much and they don't want to put pressure on spending um, because that will just make life tougher for the Reserve Bank, Um, but other times I hear that they may do something to provide cost of living support. One of the biggest pressures they face is just the surge in energy costs, and there may be something they can do on that front, but I'm not quite sure what, but you may see some announcements on that in the budget. And the other one, of course, is a bit more spending on Medicare, which is designed to reduce the cost of medicines. Uh, I think there was talk in the run-up to the election of the extra $750 million being spent on Medicare. Uh, one of the key focuses in all of this, of course, will be on the ultimate size of budget deficit. We already know that the 2021-2022 uh, budget deficit came in much smaller than the previous government budgeted for. Back in March, they were talking about $80 billion. It came in at $32 billion. So that's almost a $50 billion saving due to uh, stronger corporate tax revenue and um, lower welfare payments and also delays in some spending. Some of that saving will carry forward to future years. So there is obviously the initiatives that the federal, the current government ran into the election with, which roughly speaking we're going to cost $1.5 to $2 billion a year over the next, say, four or five years. Um, but there will be some savings because the starting point for the budget deficit is somewhat lower. So that may help a little bit. So I I think we'll probably see a deficit number for 2022-2023 lower than the $78 billion that the federal government was budgeting back in March, Um, but it's probably going to be north of the $32 billion we saw in the last financial year. So bottom line is probably somewhat lower Uh, budget deficits for the subsequent years, but still not into surplus and not as not as uh, not improving as much as the uh, the latest budget update would indicate. That's um that's really interesting. And uh, I I guess one subject and one final subject that I wanted to touch on, Shane, and one that keeps coming up in headlines is these stage three income tax cuts. Now these were legislated back in 2019 with the support of both major parties, I should say, and they're due to come into effect in July 2024. So are you able to explain to listeners what these tax cuts are all about, why they seem to be so controversial at present, and and why if they don't come online until 2024, they actually matter at all in the context of the budget later this month? Well, the stage three tax cuts, I guess, as the term implies, uh, the third stage in tax cuts that were originally announced back in 2018. So a long time ago now, the first two stages were mainly aimed at, at low and middle income earners and the final stage particularly benefits the higher income earners. Uh, they are quite significant. Uh, they cost up to $20 billion a year, $250 billion a year, uh, uh, $250 billion a year over a decade. Uh, so, you know, there's been an argument arise since those tax cuts were paced, uh, passed into law back in 2019, including with support from the current government, uh, that uh, maybe those tax cuts should be foregone. Um, they're simply costing too much. 
Uh, some have argued that, well, look what happened in the UK when they announced tax cuts has caused big problems for the UK government and the UK economy with a sharp rise in interest rates and a sharp plunge in the value of the British pound. I, I think the situation is somewhat different in Australia and that these tax cuts have already been legislated, so they're already in the budget numbers, so to speak. Uh, so it's not new stimulus um, and therefore markets have already adjusted to them a long time ago. The other aspect is that they don't kick in until 2024. Uh, you know, so therefore, very different to what we're seeing in the UK, um, where they were kicking in almost immediately and therefore adding to the problems that the Bank of England would face in trying to control inflation. In Australia's case, they're not till 2024, by which time we may be seeing much slower economic growth and inflation could well have subsided substantially by then. In fact, I think it will have subsided substantially by then. Uh, so it, it seems as if the government has delayed doing anything about them. I mean, the, the pressure seemed to be on, the implications seem to be, well, we've got all these pressures on the budget from increased NDIS spending, aged care, health, defence and higher interest charges associated with higher bond yields and interest rates, and that therefore we can't afford them. Um, but the latest reading we get is that the any attempt to delay them or to change them um, has been deferred and the government will presumably look at the issue a bit later. Obviously, changing them or removing them altogether would lead to a big political issue because the government did commit to support them going into the election. Um, and so, therefore, the government may want to avoid that uh, political backlash that would otherwise flow. But just to put some detail around it, uh, at, at present, um, yeah, anyone earning 45000 to 120000 pays 32.5 cents a dollar of extra income. Um, going forward, that would be under the tax cuts, which kick in in July 2024, that would be cut to 30, 30 cents of the dollar. So anyone over 45000 would get a tax cut. Um, those earning more than 120000 to 180000 they're paying 37 cents of the dollar. Um, going forward from 2024, again, that would, that would be stuck at 30%. And that tax bracket of 180,000 would be pushed all the way out to 200,000. It's only over 200,000 that you'd pay the 45 cents in the dollar top tax rate. So again, very different to what they're doing in the UK where they're actually eliminating that top tax rate and chopping it back from 45 to 40, uh, which recently they've, they've decided they won't do in the UK. But um, the, the, the key point from all of this is that the tax cuts actually do kick in for anyone earning more than 45,000. Um, it's not just the high income as you get a tax cut, it's also for those earning 45000 or more. For example, someone earning 80000 uh, if the tax cuts proceed, would get a saving annually of $875. $875. If you run $120,000, you get a saving of $1,875. And obviously the amounts increase um, as you earn more income. Um, the, the main argument for continuing the tax cuts is quite simple, and that is the last time the top tax rates were changed or the brackets were changed was back in 2008, 2009. Since then, there's been a lot of bracket creep. We've seen more and more people fall into the higher income tax brackets, brackets that were never intended for them, but they only find themselves there because their wage has gone up. And so, therefore, the, the Stage 3 tax cuts were really about returning bracket, bracket creep um, to investors or to, to taxpayers. Um, rather than a, a brand new tax cut, so to speak. Um, and the argument is if you don't do that, then you end up with a disincentive effect because you're going to find more and more and more Australian taxpayers find themselves creeping into these higher tax brackets. Uh, and if, if their wages go up, a big chunk of the increase in wage will actually be taken up as in more tax. So that's the main argument to continue with them, but obviously this debate will continue probably well beyond the budget, but it does seem as if the government has currently decided to defer uh, consider, any consideration of removing them or delaying them until um, after this budget. So that's what we seem to have got to on that particular issue. Well, like you said, uh, I guess we'll uh, have to wait and see what happens on that one. But um, we're going to have to leave it there for today, Shane. But thank you so much for joining us uh, again and giving us such a thorough run through of uh, what we might be able to expect on budget night. Thanks, Tom. It's been my pleasure. And all the best for the uh, 
for how the budget unfolds and whether you're affected or not. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, I will be uh, watching with a uh, bated breath, that's for sure. Uh, before we go, don't forget that if you enjoy listening to Friends With Money, we'd love for you to recommend it to your own friends and family. Or you can help us out by leaving a review on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app. You can also send in any questions, comments, or even topic ideas that you'd love for us to cover to our dedicated email, which is podcast at moneymag.com.au. And finally, make sure you head over to moneymag.com dot com dot au for all the latest financial news and stories including from yours truly that's it for this episode of the friends of money with money podcast though but we'll be back in your feeds at the same time next week i'm tom watson bye for now thanks for listening to the friends with money podcast for credible independent and easy to understand financial commentary visit moneymag.com.au Please remember that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are general in nature and further independent advice and research based on your personal circumstances should be sought before making an investment decision.